So, you might remember I showed you this yesterday, um, but uh, there was another thing missing from it, which um, yesterday we talked about MicroPython. Today we're going to talk about this strange emission. Um, so, this leads me to our morning talk about, uh, from uh, Russell Keith McGee. Russ is, I think, well on his way to cementing his place as one of the Python community's future elder statesmen. Uh, sitting, <laughs> sitting in his comfy chair off to the side with a glass of whiskey, muttering the occasional pearl of wisdom or something about the kids these days. He's clearly not there yet though, he's very active and he's a core member of the Django community and he's got his own projects as well on the side. He's had a decade of contributions to the Django core team and he's also been the past president of the Django Software Foundation for I think it was five years. And he's the organiser of DjangoCon AU, so he's a busy guy. He's here today to talk about Python's future on platforms other than webs and desktops and servers and what that could mean for Python and for the Python community. So please welcome Russ to the stage. Um, I actually, I checked with Richard yesterday after Damien George's talk. Uh, apparently this wasn't intentional, uh, but there is an interesting synergy with yesterday's talk. Uh, I'm also uh, an expat of a phys physics department. Uh, my undergraduate degree is also in physics, just like Damien. Uh, however, unlike Damien, um, I then formally migrated over to the computer science department where I got my PhD. So while as a physicist, I also write extremely bad hacky code, as a computer scientist, I've been formally trained to know that it's bad code. But it's a PhD, so it's purely theoretical knowledge. <laughs> um, so yes, for those who haven't met me before, hi, um, I'm Russell. I've been a member of the Django core team for almost 11 years now, and I was a president of the Django Software Foundation from 2010 to the end of 2015. Django is a big part of the broader Python ecosystem, but it is by no means the only part. There are other web frameworks. There are great tools for data analysis. There are projects for using Python in education and on embedded devices. None of this has happened overnight. Python as a language is 25 years old. It took maybe 10 years for Python to gain significant traction in our industry and another 10 before it really started to gather widespread support. What we see today as the Python community is the result of thousands of hours of mostly volunteered effort. But despite all this effort, Python has really only been available on server and desktop platforms, devices that fit a very traditional concept of what a computer is. But over the last 10 years, we've seen the emergence of a whole new class of devices, much smaller and usually portable, things like phones, tablets, watches, set-top boxes. My reading of the tea leaves is what has led me to change the focus of my open source contributions over the last couple of years. These days I'm spending most of my time not on Django, I do still involve myself with Django, but uh, I spend a lot more time on the Beware project. For those who haven't come across it before, Beware is an open source collection of tools and libraries cr for creating native user interfaces in Python for desktop, but also for iOS, for Android, for single page web apps, and for other new hardware platforms. Now, as Richard pointed out yesterday, Guido drew attention to MicroPython and the fact that you can run Python on embedded devices, and Damien talked about this yesterday. Uh, but what Guido didn't point out is that we can also fill the other box too for mobile devices, and that's what Beware is all about. You'll also notice that this makes Python the first language to tick all four boxes, which means that it is entirely possible to Python all the things. If it isn't already clear, I like Python. I think it's, an elegant, it's got an elegant, expressive, most importantly, readable language. It's got a great standard library and a really rich ecosystem of tools around the outside of that. I love the minimalist syntax and the significant white space. To me, that's just enforcing at a language level code style, guide, code style guidelines that are just good engineering practice. I'm not for a second going to claim that Python is perfect. It's not. But it's as close to perfect as I've ever come across, and I'm very happy living my life as a Pythonista. And because of that, I want to be able to run Python on all my devices, not just some token notion of running Python either. I want to be able to use Python to deliver a full developer experience. I want to be able to develop and deliver applications for these platforms, not in some Python sandbox, but as a fully-fledged, first-class citizen of their device ecosystems. 
Now, if you're here today at PyCon, I probably don't have to convince you of the benefits of Python as a language. What I might need to convince you of is that it is indeed plausible or even desirable to run Python on non-traditional devices. And assuming that it is possible, that it's even worth the effort to try. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, the how and the why of Pythoning all the things. OK, so first off, let's deal with the how. There's absolutely no point in getting all philosophical about why you should do something if you can't actually do it. So let's play a game. You have been given some brand new fancy hardware device that's been dropped into your lap. What options do you have for getting Python to run on it? Well, to answer that question, you actually need to start a little bit higher up and ask a slightly different question. You have to start with what. What is Python? Well, it's a programming language, right? Except that it isn't. Depending upon who's talking, Python could be one of two things. Python, the language, is an abstract thing. It's a specification of syntax and semantics that describes how a particular sequence of human readable bytes will be interpreted to make a computer do something interesting. Then there's the Python interpreter that you actually install and run. When you tell someone to go to the Python website and, and download the installer, you're not strictly talking about Python, you're probably talking about CPython, which is the de facto reference implementation of the Python language standard. This separation between implementation and specification is valuable because it means that CPython isn't the only way that Python can be interpreted. There are features of Python that are experienced by end users that are features of CPython, not the language itself. The GIL, for example, the global interpreter lock, the perpetual bane of, uh, of Python performance discussions, is not an inherent feature of Python. It's a feature of CPython a specific reference implementation of the Python language specification. CPython, because of the way it's implemented, has a GIL. Other implementations of, Python, of the Python language specification, Jython, PyPy, Stackless, don't have a GIL. This separation means that when we're talking about getting Python running on fancy new hardware devices, there are a couple of different approaches, depending upon the capabilities of the device that you're targeting. The easiest approach, of course, is just use CPython. Um, when you start a Python shell or you run a Python script on your laptop or on your server, chances are this is what you're doing. Uh, you're running CPython, effectively uh, the reference implementation of the Python language standard written in C. And one of the side effects of being written in C is that it's really easy to port to new platforms. In this regard, uh, CPython follows the tradition that's laid down by Unix. One of the major reasons for the prolif proliferation of Unix as an operating system is that in the early days of computing, dozens of manufacturers were producing computers. IBM, DEC, Univac, NCR, Honeywell, General Electric, Siemens, Fujitsu, Hitachi, NEC. And technology was advancing so quickly that there would be major shifts in architecture between versions of a device, even between the same manufacturer. Then, Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, Brian Kernighan, and a bunch of other people working at Bell Labs worked something out. If you could define a minimal kernel that could be ported to any machine, providing a common API for basic operations like memory management, process invocation, I.O., then you could use that kernel to bootstrap the rest of an operating system. They then developed an entire programming language, C, to make this even easier. The original versions of C were developed to make it easy to port Unix to other platforms. The kernel, the very, very base of the kernel, was written in assembly language for a specific machine and a specific architecture. And that got even smaller and smaller as the operating parts of the operating system could be written in C and therefore easily ported to a new kernel. And that's essentially what CPython looks like when you want to port it. It's just at a slightly higher level of abstraction. It assumes the existence of a C compiler, but as long as you've got a C compiler, which is a pretty safe assumption for a lot of platforms, the CPython core can be compiled and give you a Python interpreter you can run and a libpython that can be embedded into any process that runs on that machine. And that is a basic threshold that most modern devices can support. If you look in the lib directory of the Python 2.7 source tree, this is what you'll find, a list of all the platforms that have explicit support in the Python source tree. Python 3 has pruned a lot of these out. Uh, OS2 EMX, for example, any, any OS2 veterans here? Represent, there we go. What about BIOS, any BBOX owners? Yeah, yeah BBOX owner, yeah, there we go, all right. Unfortunately, they're no longer supported. Um, <laughs> But hopefully the point is clear. As long as you can compile the kernel, the core CPython implementation, you get the rest of the Python standard library and the Python ecosystem for free. 
But even this compilation process gives you some options. If you're using a compiled language like C, the usual approach is to write some code and use the compiler on the same machine that you intend to run that code. If you're on a desktop or a server machine, that works great because you almost certainly have a C compiler. After all, you had to have one to port Unix. But on some devices, this isn't plausible, either because a compiler hasn't been ported to that platform or because compilation on device just isn't feasible. Uh, consider, do you really want to be running a compiler on your watch? Compilation is a CPU-intensive process. Do you really want your watch to turn into a molten ball of slag, burn a hole into the center of the earth while it's attached to your wrist? <laughs> I don't think so. So you really do need to have a way to compile somewhere else and get the compiled product onto your watch. And that's what cross-compilation is. Uh, a compiler, remember, at the end of the day, is just a magic box that takes human-readable input and makes machine-readable output. But there's nothing that says that the machine-readable output has to be read by the same machine that is doing the compilation. It's just bytes at the end of the day. And yeah, OK, it is more difficult to set up, and there are plenty of opportunities for things to go wrong, but these are resolvable problems. And again, Python has this ability to cross-compile built into its build system. This is something you almost get for free when you use the GNU autoconf toolchain. I say almost because, well, GNU autoconf is a very special snowflake. But at least in principle, um, the GNU toolchain has been designed to support platform cost compilation. Remember, this is the reason C compilers exist in the first place, to make it easy to port a binary to a new machine. Okay, so as long as you have a C compiler that runs on your new hardware device, or you have a C compiler that can target that device, you're set. You can compile the stock C Python sources, and you get the same C Python that you use on a server. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have the same Python experience, though. If you're running on a watch, you can't just open a shell prompt and start typing in a new command. So you have a problem. How do you interact with Python when you don't have standard in and standard out? Are you stuck? The good news is, no, you're not. C Python is written in C, and while it's certainly designed to be invoked from a command line and provide a prompt, it doesn't require that. The command line experience is essentially just a wrapper around a very specific set of setup and teardown tooling. The code for the Python executable itself, you know, python.exe, is remarkably simple. It really is just a pipeline for getting keyboard, in keyboard input and file input and passing it to the real engine, an embedded library that's called, not surprisingly, libpython. This library is what implements the actual let's run all the Python code part of the puzzle. So as long as you can build a binary, any binary, that initializes and invokes some key methods in libpython, you can have Python running on any device you want. And then it's just up to the device to determine how you pipe the Python script into the Python interpreter running on that device. Once you've got a running interpreter, you're going to want to access the system native library so you can actually interact with the capabilities of the device that you're running on. Now, you've got this far. It's if you've got this far, it's because you have a C compiler, which generally means you've got a C library under the hood providing those services. This means you can use one of the features of the Python standard library, C types, to access those services. C types is a library that exploits the fact that at the assembly language level, the way you invoke a function, what's known as the calling convention, the calling convention used by C compilers is well defined. Since it's well-defined, it means you don't actually have to use a C compiler to generate code that will be interpreted as a function call. Any tool that can generate a compatible sequence of assembly language commands can invoke any function in a library that claims to be C, regardless of what language is doing the calling or what language the library was actually written in. And there's a helper library called FFI, the foreign function interface, that makes this easy to do. And C types is then Python's built-in wrapper around FFI. Using C types, all you have to do is reference the C library, then describe the prototype of a C method that you believe to be in that library, and then you can invoke that method directly from raw Python without the need to compile anything on the Python side. For example, we could use C types to load libc, the standard C library on POSIX boxes, the utility library, and we can tell that library that uh, there is a function called stercher, there is, it takes a character pointer, a C char p, and a C character, a C char, and it returns a C character pointer, C char P, then you can invoke that method directly. There's no need to compile anything. You just have to open up a prompt and start running that code. 
So whatever system libraries your platform performs, you can access them from Python. If you want, you can then write a wrapper library to provide a nicer API, and then it's just up to you to what interface you want to provide. At that point, you have a fully functioning Python on your new hardware device with full access to the entire system libraries. Now, when this approach works, it's pretty straightforward to get going. It's the approach that makes Python available on pretty much every desktop and server machine that's ever been manufactured. It's also the approach that I've used to get uh, Python working on iPhones, iPads, Apple TV, set-top boxes, and in principle, Apple Watches, though I haven't actually had a chance to test it with an actual watch. Although Apple hides a lot of the details between Xcode and Objective-C and more recently Swift, the core of what Apple is doing on all its devices is plain old Unix and C. And so compiling CPython for iOS, for tvOS, for watchOS, is relatively simple, and you can access all the system native libraries, even though iOS is advertising them as being Objective-C, using C types. But what about when it doesn't work? What happens when you don't have a C compiler, or C isn't the native system language? Like, for example, on Android. Well, then you have to take a different approach. If you read the advertising copy for Android, it sells itself as a Linux, and then, prom uh, then promotes Java as its user space programming language. The catch is, it's not really either of those things. Yes, at, at some level, it is notionally a Linux, but not at any level that is actually interesting to end developers. The kernel is written in C, and you can use a C compiler that will target that kernel, but the C level really only has access to bare level system services. You can't actually do anything interesting from the Android as a portable computing device perspective. All of Android's user space libraries are exposed using Java APIs. And Android isn't the only platform that does this. Sun, now Oracle, has spent a lot of money developing the Java ecosystem, an entire ecosystem based around the Java virtual machine as a runtime platform, abstracting away hardware differences. Both these platforms do a head feint uh, to the significance of native libraries. Android provides NDK, the native developer kit. Uh, both Android and JVM provide something called JNI, the Java native interface. Uh, but the focus of all the tooling on, both th on, on these platforms is heavily directed at the use of Java for user space code. So, yes, you can just port CPython to Android um, using CPython as a starting point, but it's also not the natural interface to that platform your life will be a lot easier if you do what the platform actually wants you to do. There are also platforms where it just isn't practical to use CPython. Um, MicroPython, you heard about yesterday, is a really good example of this. CPython is a fantastic implementation of Python as a language specification. But embedded devices, as we heard yesterday, have some really extreme constraints by comparison to servers and, and laptops. And CPython is just too big to use in an unmodified state on an embedded microcontroller. So you have to look at other ways of providing an implementation of the Python language spec if you want to use it. So if you've got one of these platforms and you want to use Python on it, you effectively need to provide a new implementation of Python, one that is native to the capabilities of that platform. So how do you do that? Well, OK, there are a couple of ways to tackle this problem. One option is to use a different compiler. CPython is obviously designed to be compiled using a C compiler, but there are C compilers out there that don't target traditional system executables. One really notable example is Inscripten. It's a compiler, strictly a compiler backend because it still uses the C parser part of the, the puzzle, but rather than outputting a binary that can be executed as a .exe file on some platform, it outputs JavaScript specifically a subset of JavaScript called ASMJS that is known to run fast on certain JavaScript implementations. Now, remember, a compiler is just a black box for turning human-readable bits into machine-readable bits. Nothing said those machine-readable bits had to be machine language. So turn them into, a, uh, turn them into, into uh, uh, JavaScript. And if you take this approach, what you get is PyPyJS, a project by Ryan Kelly. Is Ryan here hiding somewhere? No, there he is at the back, right, OK. Um, and for, you know, this, what, you, what you get is PyPyJS. It takes the PyPy source code rather than CPython. Uh, but what you get at the end of the day is a block of JavaScript that will run Python code. And for suitably selected benchmarks, it does so faster than CPython native on the same machine. I'll let Ryan deal with the details of those potential particular benchmarks. Um, but if you're not going to just recompile existing sources, you'll need to re-implement CPython. The good news is that you don't have to implement all of CPython. 
What do I mean by that? Well, if you pull apart a Python implementation, there are a couple of different pieces. The full stack of Python consists of a parser, which takes human input and turns it into an in-memory representation of code, a compiler, which takes that in-memory representation and turns it into something that can be executed. In CPython, that's bytecode, an eval loop, which can be read to run the output of the compiler. This is what you experience as the Python executable. And then there's the standard library, which, can, which is used by the code running through the eval loop. The standard library comes in two pieces. There are pieces that are written in native, uh, native language and bits that are written in Python. The bits in native language are either system specific, for example, hitting raw POSIX system calls, or they're done natively for, for performance reasons. The simple approach, re-implement the lot. Rewrite the whole thing in Java or C Sharp or whatever other language you want to target. Those parts of the standard library that are written in Python don't need to be re-implemented, but the rest needs to be ported over to your new language or to your new, new platform. And this is what MicroPython, Jython, IronPython, Sculpt, Brython, a bunch of others do. Wholesale re-implementations of all of CPython, except for the bits of the standard library that are already written in Python and can be used as is. But that's not the only approach you can take. You don't have to throw out the entire CPython stack and start from scratch. CPython provides, not surprisingly, a really good parser for Python code that outputs a data structure that is a parsed, ready to manipulate version of the code that has been entered by a human. This data structure is called the AST, or the Abstract Syntax Tree. And it's, represent it's a representation that has been designed to be manipulated and converted. The normal CPython compiler takes that AST and converts it into bytecode that can then be executed by CPython's ev event loop. However, you can just as easily take that AST and turn it into any other representation that would be helpful. For example, Java bytecode or .NET CLR bytecode. And that approach is what Voc does. Voc is effectively a cross-compiler for Python code. It's a compiler written in Python, so it can be executed by CPython, but it outputs Java bytecode that can run on any JVM instance. When the Java bytecode runs, it's indistinguishable from code that has come from Java source code compiled by the Java compiler. It, but it just refers to line numbers from the Python source code. OK, so we can reuse CPython's parser to make our life a little, little easier. Do we have to stop there? Is there any more of CPython that we can reuse in our quest to get Python on a different platform? Well, yeah, if you want to, you can even reuse CPython's compiler too. When you run some Python code that's in a .py file through the CPython compiler, it outputs a .pyc file. That .pyc file is the compiled version of the code. It's a binary representation, but not a system binary, not a, an executable by itself. It's a bytecode representation. Bytecode is a bit like a sort of high-level assembly language. It's an encoded set of instructions for a stack-based virtual machine that has basic primitives like pushing and popping onto a stack, setting attributes on an object, handling exceptions, and so on. There's nothing about Python, the language, that specifies bytecode. It's entirely a runtime format used by the CPython interpreter. The CPython interpreter is what provides the virtual machine that can actually execute that bytecode. But there's nothing to say that we couldn't create an independent implementation of the CPython virtual machine capable of running CPython bytecode. And that's what Batavia does. Batavia is an implementation of the CPython virtual machine written in JavaScript. And because it's written in JavaScript, it can run in the browser. Now, while that might seem a little bit daunting, it's actually not that hard. After all, CPython bytecode is only 100 or so operations. It's sort of a pseudo assembler at the end of the day. And a good chunk of those operations, of those 100 operations, are basic mathematical primitives, plus, minus, multiply, divide. So re-implementing those doesn't take a whole lot of code. The biggest complication in that process is that CPython, because bytecode is not part of the specification, CPython makes no guarantees of compatibility in bytecode versions. And between Python 3.4, 3.5, and 3.6, there have been several major changes in bytecode format and interpretation. But you can stay on top of those if you want to. It's not a major problem, just kind of an annoyance from someone who's sitting there trying to re-implement a bytecode machine. Now, whenever I tell anybody about Batavia, the first reaction I hear is normally, well, why don't you just compile Python code into JavaScript? 
And yeah, okay, that is actually an option. On the surface, it even seems relatively easy. Um, there, sure, there are some syntactic differences between Python and JavaScript, but a lot of those are cosmetic, you know, using braces and different looping constructs. The catch is, though, if you dig a little bit deeper, it's a lot more complex than that. You don't just want a language that looks like Python. You want it to run like Python as well. And Python's scoping rules are very different to JavaScript's. Let's take this really simple example. These two code snippets are cosmetically the same, modulo a language translation. The only thing that's a little bit hairy is the change in the arguments to the print statement. One takes a sequence of arguments, the other is using concatenation with a plus operator. Okay, what gets output when you run them? When you run the JavaScript code at the top, you call scope test three and then you output the value of x, what do you get? Prints 30. What about the Python? Unbound local error, because x has been referenced before assignment. Why? Because JavaScript scoping rules put x in global scope. Python scoping rules mean that x can be accessed for reading, but not for writing. Now, okay, for the pedants, yes, if you used ES6 let instead of var, um, or you use global in the Python version, you'd get output that would be comparable here. This is an intentionally simple example to illustrate the point. The problem gets a whole lot more complex than this if you start talking about things like closures. So, if you want to preserve Python's semantics in JavaScript, you can't just do a syntax conversion, or at least not a simple syntax conversion. You actually have to parse the code and generate JavaScript constructs that expose the same lexical scoping that Python expects. Which means you're basically left with three choices. You can either re-implement Python's scoping rules in JavaScript, you can treat your resulting compiler as a Python-like language that looks like Python but has lots of subtle differences, or something in between the two. And it turns out, it actually ends up being a lot easier to implement the bytecode machine because all you have to deal with is the values that are in a single stack. Okay, so what's the downside of reusing CPython's parser or compiler? Well, it means that you've made a decision that parts of your stack won't be running on your new platform. If you're reusing CPython's parser and compiler, then that obviously means that part of the stack will only run where CPython will run. You're effectively cross-compiling your Python code using one platform to produce a binary that will run somewhere else. That means your Python platform, or your target platform, won't have the ability to parse and compile code on its own. This means that the one thing you don't get on your new platform is a REPL, a read, eval, print loop. That is the Python prompt where you can interactively type and execute Python code. Having a REPL relies on the ability to compile code locally. If you don't have a native compilation capability, you can't have a REPL. Now that might seem like a really big omission, but the platforms we're targeting here aren't natural matches for a REPL. Nobody really wants to be typing Python code into their watch. So on these devices, Python is really about being a high productivity programming language, not an interactive programming language. And you also have to think about the entire development cycle. Remember, one of the reasons that we're porting to Python is so that the same code can run on multiple, multiple devices. You could develop code on a, dev on a desktop machine using CPython and a REPL, use some mocking and stub libraries for the system native parts, and then once the core, li core logic of your app is working, ship it to the device for final testing. Okay, so at this point, either by re-implementing or borrowing from CPython, you've got a parser, you've got a compiler, and you've got some mechanism for executing that code. So you can run Python code on that machine, but only the code. There's still a big piece missing, the standard library. The CPython standard library is made up of two parts. There's a pure Python part and a part that's written in C. The bit that's written in pure Python is easy. You can just take it and compile it wholesale. It's Python code, it compiles as Python code the same as everything else. We can compile it to bytecode, run it through our new virtual machine, or we can cross-compile it to our new target platform, or just re uh, run it on our re-implemented Python, whatever you need to do. But the bits written in C are a little bit more complicated. There's a couple of reasons why a module might be written in C. Firstly, there are occasions where what you're doing is talking directly to system services. If you're going to make a POSIX exec call, well, you're going to need to call the C method that implements a POSIX exec. There are also modules that are implemented in C because they're just a wrapper around some library whose implementation is in C. Uh, BZIP2, for example, is a compression library. The reference implementation for BZIP2 is in C. Sure, you could rewrite it, but why would you? You just use libbz2. 
Lastly, there are parts of the standard library that are implemented in C for performance reasons. For example, the decimal module uh, used to be implemented in pure Python. Uh, for performance reasons, it was ported to C in Python 3.5. And that's great for C Python as, a link, as an implementation of Python. Nobody's going to complain about higher performance. But if you're looking at C Python as a reference implementation, it's a bit more annoying because it means that that's now something you have to implement natively. What we really need here is a reference standard library as well, an implementation of the Python standard library that is written entirely in pure Python, uh, except for a clearly delineated minimal interface to system services. And that's what Ouroboros is. Um, for those not up in your Greek mythology, that's, uh, the Ouroboros is the symbol of a snake eating its own tail. tail. Um, Ouroboros is very much a work in progress, but it's an important part of the whole puzzle if we're going to make it easy to bring Python to as many platforms as possible. The last piece of the puzzle is deployment. Now, this is an area where Python historically has not had a very good story. Even in the web world, which is considered one of Python's strengths, Python's deployment story lags a long way behind other languages like PHP. A PHP developer just needs a directory where they can FTP code into, maybe some details about the host where, they're going to be, where the database is going to be connected, uh, and they can deploy a site. A Python web developer needs to know about WSGI, web server configuration, mechanisms for activating virtual environments. It's not too daunting once you know how all the pieces work, but it's certainly a long way from one-click deployment, and it's a lot more daunting than first-time developers are generally ready for. And as hard as it is to believe, the situation is worse for desktop. You want someone with a Windows computer to run your Python script? Good luck with that. Better hope they've got admin access and know how to find the dialog hidden three levels deep in the control panel that lets them set their path environment variable. The good news is that this problem can be solved. And moving to platforms like phones and watches will force us as a community to address these problems. These devices don't have a control panel. If you want to distribute apps for a phone, you need to package them as standalone tools with a simple entry point. And we have to develop the tooling for these new platforms, so why not take a look at our existing platforms while we're at it? And this is what I've been trying to do with a tool called Briefcase. It's a disutils extension that will convert any Python project with a setup.py file into a deployable unit. Now, again, it's also early days for Briefcase, but it works on Mac OS, it works on iOS, it works on tvOS, it has preliminary support for Android. Uh, if anybody here has an interest in, uh, in Windows, I've got some ideas about how this, the approach that's used for Mac OS could be used to make the Windows deployment story easy as well. So, you know, come talk to me. <coughs> now, a lot of the specific tools and libraries that I've spoken about so far have been, are in very early stages of development. The flip side of this is that there's a lot of very fertile ground for contributions. If you want to get involved, uh, I'm here to the end of the sprints. Uh, no matter your level of expertise, and I do mean no matter your level of expertise, uh, come grab me during the sprints and we can find something for you to work on. And if you do, thanks to MaxCDN, I've actually got a shiny uh, Beware Contributors Challenge coin that uh, everyone will get. So. That's the how. That's how you introduce Python to a new hardware platform. But why? Why is this important? Why have I spent so much time and effort trying to get Python to run in places where it doesn't currently run? For me, it's about evaluating our existential threats as a programming community. Python is on the bit of a crest of a bit of a wave at the moment. Over the last 25 years, we have built up a significant community and resources and expertise. And as a result, most surveys, including that one from IEEE before, put uh, Python in the top four or five programming languages you should know, usually only behind Java and C, C++ in some variation and order. The growth of events like PyCon, uh, are a great indication of that success. So in the midst of this success, it behooves us to look to the future and consider whether the light at the end of the tunnel is the dawning of a bright tomorrow or a train coming straight for us. We need to ask, quo vadimus, where are we going? Python has been around for 25 years. It was originally found a foothold as a systems integration language on servers. Over time, it found another niche as web server, resulting in Zoop and Django and Pyramid and Plone and others. The era of Python as a major web platform is maybe 10 years old. Since that time, Python has found footholds as an education language, as a data analysis language. It's found footholds because it's an easy and straightforward language to teach while retaining the power of a hardcore computer science language. We've developed a reputation. We've developed a community. We've developed a rich ecosystem of tools and libraries around the core of the language. So what changes are coming that pose a potential existential threat to all of this? 
Well, the most obvious one is the one that I've been addressing directly so far. The last 10 years have seen an explosion in the platforms that people are using for computing and the types of people that are using those platforms. Computers aren't just for geeks anymore. These devices have rapidly become an indispensable part of everyone's lives. And this means that these new platforms are becoming an increasingly important part of the development landscape. If Python doesn't have a good story for mobile, we run the risk of being left behind. Servers aren't going anywhere, but they've only ever been used by a very small portion of the community. And the growth of services like serverless computing uh, is part of a larger trend to hide even more server details. As for desktop machines, sales trends uh, of desktop machines versus phones and tablets, they're certainly pointing towards a time where desktop machines, uh, as we currently think of them at least, either won't exist or will exist in a radically different form to what we, what we think of them today. So if using a general purpose language that can only be used in a tiny portion of computing devices, what hope does that language community as a whole have? I'd say not much. But the threat is also a huge opportunity Many of the areas where Python has gained traction, in, in science, in education, these are areas where, the new, where new devices have the potential to make a huge impact. Imagine a world where a scientist can knock together a quick user interface to put in the hands of experimenters to gather information, or provide an app so that citizen scientists can log local flora, fauna, environmental conditions. Imagine a world where you can get kids excited in programming because they can build something that runs on their phone that they can show to their friends. Imagine a Django Girl style event where students leave the tutorial after a day, having come in knowing very little about, about programming, but leave with a mobile phone app that they use to upload photos to their blog. Python is a general purpose programming language. There's no reason it has to be tied to historical platforms. We just have to pay attention to the new platforms that are emerging. So what are we competing against here? And what advantages does Python bring to that struggle? Well, we're competing against a background environment where polylingualism is required. At present, there is not a single programming language that can be used on every platform as a native offering. Apple pushes Objective-C and Swift as their preferred languages. Android pushes Java. The web requires JavaScript. So today, if you're a scientist or a student and you wanted to write an app that was available on multiple platforms, you would have to learn several different programming languages, three, maybe four. Polylingualism, be it in computer languages or human languages, is a good thing. There are countless studies out there that reinforce the benefits of learning a second spoken language. Improvements in perception, memory, decision making, problem solving. This is also true of programming languages. Learning a second or third or fourth programming language, especially when it's a completely different programming paradigm, is a great way to encourage your brain to think about problems in a different, creative way. And if you're a professional computer scientist or software engineer, I'd absolutely encourage you to learn as many programming languages as you can. But that's not the market we're talking about here. Unlike spoken languages, there isn't an obvious first contact programming language. If you're born in Melbourne, your first spoken language will almost certainly be English. If you're born in Beijing, it's almost certainly going to be Mandarin. But in computer languages, there isn't an obvious first contact language. There isn't a programming language that everyone in a community speaks by virtue of just existing in that community. That means there is ground to be won. It's this first contact status that is, to my mind, critical. Consider the world 20 years ago. Visual Basic was one of the most widespread programming languages in common usage, not because it was an especially powerful programming language, but because it was present on every Windows computer, was accessible to non-expert users, and enabled people to do really powerful things with the Office suite of apps. Visual Basic was their first contact programming language. Many users never moved beyond it. Neither should they have had to. There is immense power in being the language that people use to discover programming. And Python has repeatedly demonstrated that it's a great candidate to be the first contact programming language. From Django Girls to university level computer science courses, Python has been used as an introductory programming language. And yet, unlike Visual Basic, it's a programming language that is able to support very sophisticated computer science concepts like generators and asynchronous processing and so on. 
When marketing people talk about selling a product, they often talk about conversion funnels. A conversion funnel is the idea that there is an entire world of people out there, uh, but they have to move through your sales pro process to buy your product. At each step they have to go through that process, some loss is probably inevitable, and the funnel narrows. But the goal is that at the end of the day, they're going to end at the bottom of your funnel as a user of your product, a consumer of your product, a purchaser of your product. The, the goal of marketing is to minimize the loss between each step and end up with a viable output of the funnel at the end of the day. It can help to think about the adoption of software projects in a very similar set of terms. There is a world of potential users out there. Some of them will actually use your product. Some of them will continue to use your product. Some of them will become members of your community. Some of them will become contributors to your community. Some of them will become members of the core team and eventually lead the community. Now, there are two ways to hack a conversion funnel. You can work on the funnel itself and try to minimize losses as people move down the funnel. Or you can put more people into the funnel to start with. Ideally, you do both. And that's the opportunity, the opportunity that's on the table here. We have a world of people out there that look at their computers and phones and tablets and watches and set-top boxes as devices they use to passively consume content through apps that are developed by some sweaty white male boffin in a dark room. We have an opportunity to break that mold. Not only make it easier for experts to develop apps, but introduce a whole new audience to the idea that computing devices can be transformed to do what they want them to do, to meet their specific needs. There will always be a place for experts, but this new, ex uh, this new audience isn't looking to do a three-year degree in software engineering before they get started. They want to learn one language and have that language be useful wherever they need to use it. But if we're putting more people into the top of Python's conversion funnel, we're also going to get more people filtering down to the bottom. And that means more experts. And if we play our cards right, a more diverse audience of experts, not just sweaty male boffins sitting in dark rooms. People from a wide range of social, racial, economic backgrounds with rich, diverse experiences to bring to the discussion and shape the evolution of the world around us. So why do I think Python has a compelling case to be this first contact language? Well, it would be really easy for me to launch into a blistering technical critique of JavaScript or Swift or Java uh, and a defense of Python's technological superiority. But I'm not going to do that. Firstly, I don't think it adds anything to the discussion. Like it or not, JavaScript, Swift, Java, they all exist. They're all in widespread use and their implementations are battle tested. No amount of wailing about WATs are going to make JavaScript go away. It's here, it's going to stay. And it's also pointless to have those arguments. History has repeatedly shown us that technical superiority of a technology is very rarely enough to guarantee victory. Betamax and VHS, Windows and OS2, AC and DC electricity. As long as there are two options that meet basic requirements, the social structures and power relationships around a technology are much more important than the technology itself for ensuring success. <laughs> Thank you. The good news here is that Python has a compelling story when it comes to these network effects. Firstly, there is a huge breadth of domain knowledge that's encoded in Python. Through projects like NumPy, SciPy, Jupyter, BioPython, AstroPy, there is a wealth of scientific expertise in our community. Raspberry Pi, Grok Learning are leaders in the world of computing education. This isn't just a web community or a browser community. The attendance of this, this conference, the mini conferences on Friday, are clear demonstrations of that. And it will take, but it will take a, a long time for other language communities to develop analogous tooling. The Python community also has very strong social credentials. The Python community has been an industry leader in improving the participation of women and people of color, different ethnic backgrounds into our tech communities. Python and Django were amongst the first communities to, or first programming communities, to adopt codes of conduct as standard operating procedure. Initiatives like PyLadies and Django Girls has made, have made amazing contributions to the participation of women in our industry. In web design circles, it's taken a very long time to convince people that accessibility is something that's worth paying attention to. But it turns out that if you focus on accessibility, not only can the deaf and blind and neuroatypical access your website, it improves the experience for everybody else as well. There's a direct analog here with the social leadership position that Python has taken. Yes, we have adopted codes of conduct because there is a, it is a clear signal to women and minorities that we want our communities to be welcoming and friendly. But as a side effect, it means the community is nicer for everyone. A code of conduct isn't there so that women can punish men. It's there to make sure that everyone, including the men, have a pleasant experience in a welcoming and friendly community. But 
before I give myself a sprain from patting us on the back quite so vigorously, <laughs> don't get me wrong, there is still a long way to go. If you compare where we, were, where we are today to where we were 10 or 15 years ago, we've made some great strides. I'd like to draw some attention, though, to two closely related areas that I think we need to pay a lot closer attention to. The first is the spectre of burnout in our community. I started this talk, Richard started this morning, talking about the fact that the bulk of work on Python and Django were the result of volunteer efforts. I've almost lost count of the number of talented developers around me who have burned out or come dangerously close under the load that's been imposed by this volunteer effort. I've made no secret that I myself went through a major depressive episode last year, brought on in part by the, 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 the load imposed by volunteering. I'm a lot better now, but I've still got a long way to go. This isn't a problem with an easy solution. It isn't as simple as just telling someone they don't have to volunteer anymore. Because if they're the maintainer of an even moderately successful project, I guarantee you their inbox is filled with, why haven't you fixed my bug emails? Sometimes from people who should know a lot better. The greatest shocks in society occur when something we assume is plentiful and ubiquitous disappear. Petrol, electricity, clean water. If your open source project isn't planning for the day when your biggest contributor steps down or is unable to continue, your project has a clock on it. As a community, we need to institutionalize the minimization of the expectation of free labor. If you've got a project role that is going to take resources, be it material, labor, emotional energy, don't assume those resources will be available forever in boundless quantities. And if you're a free consumer of those resources, be aware of what you're consuming. If you're a commercial organization that depends on a product, then, and you aren't taking steps to, contrib uh, to contribute to the projects you use, I would argue you're being criminally negligent to your investors because you haven't secured your supply chain. You haven't mitigated a key risk associated with your technology stack. But it's not just about pointing, pointing fingers at bad projects or bad users or bad companies. As a community, we haven't established the conditions where companies are readily able to mitigate those risks. The free software community has spent a lot of time and effort discussing the importance of user freedoms. However, they've been almost silent on the unintended consequences of that position. That when software is free as in freedom, it is almost certainly free as in beer as well, which means the task of making an income off of that software is much higher. I don't want to undersell for a moment the importance of user freedom, but to focus on user freedom to the detriment of the mental and physical health of the, of the developers of that software is, in my opinion, incredibly negligent. <laughs> How to make money from free software is a question that, unfortunately, doesn't have any good answers at the moment. As a community, we need to have a very serious discussion about the economic consequences of our decisions and how to harness the not insignificant resources that the software community has at its disposal. The good news is that there's a possibly unexpected benefit um, to facing this problem head on. Finding a way to pay for the resources we consume, we're consuming certainly helps to stave off burnout, but it has the added benefit that it broadens the list of people who can do the work. Volunteers, by definition, are made up by those who have the time to volunteer. If you've got a family, or you've got children, or you've got a loved one who needs care, those commitments take priority, as well they should, and they limit your ability to volunteer. You want to address diversity? Make sure that you're not just taking from the pool of people who have copious free time, which, broadly speaking, means white, middle to, middle to upper class, Anglo-Saxon men aged 16 to 30. If you're someone who uses open source, don't just take. Give back in tangible ways, either with hard commitments of time or with cash that organizations like the Python Software Foundation or the Django Software Foundation can use. And this is incredibly important if you are a large organization with extraordinary resources at your disposal who derive immense benefit from open source and volunteered projects. Now, you'll notice that in this talk, I've spent almost as much time talking about the soft, for want of a much better word, aspects of the problem we face rather versus the hard technical problems. The technical aspects of a computing problem almost always get the most attention. But they're also the easiest ones to solve. They either have an answer or they don't. But open source projects are, ultimately, about communities of people with aligned interests acting collectively. 
This means issues of communication, collaboration, identity, social justice, inclusivity, funding. These are all intertwined with the technical aspects because without those soft aspects, the technical aspects can't be solved. And these challenges don't have simple answers. Who would have thought humans are difficult? <laughs> this is something that has taken the tech community a long time to learn. We've still got plenty we have to learn, and it's going to take a long time to institutionalize best practices. The key, though, is to pay attention to it. Whatever software community or communities you have to participate in, keep your ears open, your mouth shut, and look for ways to improve the social aspects of your project. And part of that means acknowledging any kind of privilege you have. And when I say that, I don't just mean white men either. Women can have privilege too. So can people of colour. If you don't believe me, go have a look on YouTube for Saron Yitbarak's keynote talk from DjangoCon US, a, uh, a black woman from the United States. She gives a much better explanation than I could ever provide about what privilege truly is. So, what does the future hold for Python? Well, I don't know. I've outlined what I see to be the threats and opportunities, but I am only one voice. If we, but I do know that if we want Python to continue to be a force in the world of computing, we can't stand still. We need to prepare for the future, whatever we perceive that future to be. Personally, I'm intending to keep working on Beware, the umbrella project that covers Voc and Batavia, Roboros, Briefcase, and many other tools that are necessary to get Python working in the hands of end users and to enable those users to get involved in writing their own apps. If any of those projects sound interesting, you'd like to get involved, I appreciate any help, there's plenty to do, uh, and I've got an open offer to mentor anybody who wants to get involved, even if this is your first time contributing to open source projects. And again, the con uh, challenge coin for anybody who does get involved. A call to action, without funding this is going to continue to be a hobby project. I'd like to see it become a whole lot more. I'd like to see Beware become a model for a new style of financially viable but also socially responsible open source organisation. I am currently exploring options to make this happen. One of those options is to crowdfund. Um, if you'd like to be notified as those plans evolve, I'd encourage you to visit this URL, sign up for the, uh, the mail announcement list there. If you're a company with an interest in cross-platform mobile, uh, sign up for the mailing list or contact me directly. I'm certainly open to the idea of commercial sponsorship and various arrangements, so come talk to me. All of this ultimately comes down to the old quote from Pascal, fortune favours the prepared mind. If you want any project to be successful or remain successful, you need to plan for that success. It took years for Python to become an overnight success. Django certainly benefited from some early momentum, being in the right place at the right time, but true success took years. I have personally benefited from being part of a large, successful project like Django. I'm at the early stages of what I hope will be a similar journey with Beware. And both of those projects wouldn't have been possible, or at least would have been significantly different, if it wasn't for the groundwork that was laid out by Python and the Python community. I'm very keen to make sure that that groundwork doesn't go away. It's taken 25 years to develop it. And it would be a shame if we had to develop it all over again, simply because we didn't pay attention to the way the world was changing around us. And with that, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Richard. <laughs>